come speak to the class, and my question was about what? And because uh, normally I only speak about some particular subject. He said, oh, yeah, I don't know, you're, you, uh, you're in business, in the software business, and there's computer science guys and business guys, so come talk about that. I said, well, okay, well, that's kind of still broad. And he said, well, just explain how you got into this business. So I started going down this thing, and I, I actually never told this story before. And I have to, you'll have to forgive me because my slides are just hideous. Uh, I've never put this story together before. As a matter of fact, I think if I showed this to my children, they'd be surprised. But, um, so I titled this Best Laid Plan. So I'm literally going to go through and kind of talk about how I got into business, how I, how I got into the various businesses that, I, that I've been involved in. And uh, as the name implies, it really wasn't on purpose. Um, so my beginning actually starts way at the beginning. Believe it or not, I was born there on that uh, Air Force base in Clovis, New Mexico. And the only reason that was relevant is because my father was in the Air Force and they had assigned him to work on a project that was uh, turned out to be like the first installation of an IBM computer at, in the Air Force. And that, okay, that in and of itself wasn't too particularly noteworthy, but that led to, you know, when he left the Air Force, he joined NCR and then later went to Honeywell. And then at Honeywell, he was offered a job as branch manager up there in Seattle. So we moved, uh, um, you know, loaded up the truck and headed to the offices <laughs> on Mercer Island, so we moved to Mercer Island. Now, you know, this really, I had no real knowledge of the computer industry at all. Um, but during high school, I did do some work, uh, like changing tape, some tape drives and doing running card readers and changing, you know, paper in the paper console. The computer on the left had uh, 32K of core, which is core memory RAM, basically. Um, so I was around computers, and then when I started here at the University of Washington in 1977, I had a morning job at ungodly hour, 6.30 in the morning at Simpson Timber in their data center, which was like the third largest data center west of the Mississippi. And it had, I show a little uh, drive there, that hard drive, and they had an array of 40 of these hard drives with little removable packs, and each were 50 megs. So do the math, it was, you know, two gigabytes of uh, disk, which made it the third biggest array west of Mississippi. This has 16 gigs, so you can kind of compare what's happened since then. Still, I had no real, I mean, I, my job there wasn't technical. I ran like the bursters and decalators, the machines that like take the carbon out of paper and out of reports and that sort of thing. But I was around computers. I really, um, in 1977, when I started at the University of Washington, I was headed down the path of business school. I uh, studied economics, wanted to head in business school, but I kind of got ahead of myself a little bit and started trying to make a company. So this next slide is, uh, this is me. <laughs> in 1978, I'm 18 years old, I look like I'm 12. I'm going to school here at the University of Washington, and this is actually my third product, but it was my first product that I sold at retail. And it was a, uh, this is a point of, uh, I get teased by my family. They, if they want to ridicule me, they just say HD8, because uh, they refer back to this. This is my hair dryer holder um, that I made. You see the name of my company was International Supply Company. It was me. You know, there's nothing international about it at all, but it was just me. So I went out and I sold these things to some retailers, but you know, it was plastic fabricated. So I had like heat arrays, I'd bend the stuff and glue things. And, and you know, so I had this real production problem. Um, and so I had to learn a little bit about, about manufacturing. I'm sorry. What is, what is the product? It is a, a, you can say, it's a wall mount hair dryer oh, holder. Okay. So it actually, if oh, okay. you had, you know, in the 70s, that was kind of a bigger thing, I guess. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Anyways, yeah, it mounts to the wall. You put, it's, yeah, whatever. Um, so that was from a, an interview at the Mercer Army Reporter, which uh, I didn't bring that. It was interesting. But uh, so uh, where was I? Anyway, um, I, was, I was trying to learn about, I thought classics were great, pretty cool. Um, I had done some other classic projects for like Joby water skis and some things. And, um, but I, I realized that to, in order for me to produce this at a price point that I could sell it at retail, I needed to go, I needed to, I had to learn about like injection molds. But what I learned about injection molds was 
and you've got an issue not only with the material cost but machine time. So really for me to build that thing at a price point that I could take to market and sell through distribution was going to take me buying, you know, making at least a two cavity mold which would have cost me 15, 20 grand and it might as well have been a million dollars, I didn't have it. So instead, um, I decided, well one of the things I decided at that point was I was a shy, introverted kid and I knew that I needed to learn how to sell stuff. So I had a friend who was a manufacturer's rep, um, you know, sells products basically to retailers and, uh, and he offered to let me sell some of his products. So, um, and I thought, okay, that's a, that's a good way for me to learn and so I remember like, uh, it turns out I was right, I was really bad at it because I remember like my first day, uh, I left from Seattle and I was headed north stopping at different stores trying to sell stuff and my first sale was at 4.30 in the evening in Bellingham to, uh, I sold some plush toys to a place called Rocks and Hobbies but I remember getting back to my car and it was, I sold them $1,500 worth of these plush toys and I did math, 15%, $225, hey, you know, that was pretty good money to me, my car only cost 300 bucks, so, you know, this was with good money. So I started to organize my schedule at school around being able to go out and sell and, you know, so I'd sell on weekends or certain days of the week or after school, I got rid of, uh, of uh, Simpson Timber and one of the things I also learned during this period of time was that some of the products um, that I sold, I could buy as a distributor, instead of making a 15% commission, I could make 50% margin. So I started warehousing some different products and uh, started selling them to retailers. Well, within a year of that time, 1979, I'd gone from international supply, I'd scaled down to continental <laughs> distributors. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I had three employees, you know, two salesmen and a warehouse guy, and you know, I was making payrolls, and I made payrolls for lots of decades since then. But just selling junk into these retailers, and uh, this was actually the first time I started to really think, hey, computers are cool. I mean, uh, typing invoices and purchase orders was like for the birds. I thought I'd been around enough computers, I go, hey, computers are good at this. So in the meantime, my father was part of a company called Devcom that was building a 4GL database management system for prime computers, which was a hot up and coming mini computer maker at the time. And Prime had been supportive of them and supplied them with a bunch of mini computers for their development. So I went over there and said, hey, you know, can I get access to one of your computers? And they said, sure. So I got myself a, you know, a Jetsons looking ad viewpoint terminal and a 300 baud acoustic modem and some manuals and started trying to write a warehouse management system. So at night I would go over to where their offices were and their programmers would uh, typically worked at night, strange thing. Um, and when they would get bored, they'd come over and talk to me and help me out and you know, laugh at what I was doing and say, no, don't do that. Um, and so that was my first real experience with code review. But ultimately, I built a warehouse management system. Um, so, okay, that's fine. Oh, um, so we're just off being a little distributor and trying to be opportunistic where we could. I threw in a slide here about something that we did. I don't know if you remember in 1980, but when Mount St. Helens blew up, uh, my, the guy that I originally was selling for had become my partner in this distribution company. So we rented a truck and drove down towards the mountain and filled it full of ash. And then, you ever seen those little pins with money in them? Anyway, we filled those things full of ash and made displays and sold them. That was kind of fun. But that was just kind of an opportunistic thing. Um, and so, okay, so we continued on in the, in the distribution business. At, by this time, it was getting really hard for me to um, coordinate my, my school schedule. So I went into my counselor and said, hey, look at, you know, I think I, I need to take a leave of absence just for a little while. Um, I think the next time I took an accredited or credit class at the UW was 26 years later, so <laughs> it was a little longer lapse than, than I had expected. Anyway, um, 
So by 1981, I had bought my own mini computer, and I got tired of our salespeople mailing orders into us and us having to key them into our system. So there's a local company in Redmond called Azure Data, and some of the drug companies that started using these data collection devices to punch in, you know, to transmit orders. So I got my hands on one of those and set up the comms. And in those days, you had to write your own comm layer and stuff. But we did this. I built, you know, I built a system for receiving orders. And these devices, you were, they were half duplex acoustic, so you basically held it up to the mouthpiece of the phone and sent it, uh, you know, half duplex. So we call it send and pray because you weren't really sure what you were going to get. <laughs> but for the most part, it worked and, and it was fun to do. That was my first experience with uh, mobile devices, something that would go with me for a long time. Um, anyway, uh, so in 1982, this was kind of, I threw this note in, uh, one of the products we were distributing was Timex, watches and things like that. For those of you who might remember, in 1982, Timex had done a deal with Sinclair Computer, and they were selling a, a home computer. But we were distributing that, and the margins weren't very good at it, so, or weren't very good, so uh, I had the bright idea that we were going to write some games for the Timex computer, the medium there, the I.O. was a cassette, so we put them onto a cassette, and then we bundled that with the Timex computer, and so instead of being a $99 computer, it was, you know, it was 99 but it included this, you know, $29 worth of uh, software. But that's actually part of the code from one of the games uh, that we called Duke Doom. But, uh, so that was, that was actually my first commercial software, if you want to call it that, even though it was a, a giveaway. Uh, but still, the core business that I was in was uh, distribution until 1983 when I was down selling to, there's a chain of drugstores at the time in Oregon called High School Pharmacies. And a guy named Steve Ball owned it, and I was in trying to sell him stuff. And he said, hey, I'm building a distribution facility, and I need a warehouse management system, and I need order entry you know, devices like you have. Can I sell you, you know, sell me something? And so in a few days, I sold him a system, and... And I think I made $80,000 on the initial sale of the software to him, which was like a huge amount of money to me. And uh, then they paid us to do customization, so I was able to hire one of the developers that had trained me originally to do customizations for them. And I thought, hey, I really like this. I actually like this better than being in the distribution business. Um, but the distribution business is a strange thing. It's really hard to stop being in the distribution business, because if you have inventory, and you decide to not be in the distribution business, that inventory is worth like half or less. So, uh, you know, we're still plugging away, but what the, the writing on the wall was that retailers were trying to buy more direct. They were building distribution centers, they were trying to buy centrally. Uh, point of sale systems were kind of the promise of the, of the decade, and someday they'd get to perpetual inventories, and, uh, but at the time they really didn't do that. Um, so we thought, okay, well, maybe we should be heading in a different direction. Um, in uh, 1984, I ended up selling another system to Bartell Drugs. They're still around, so you've probably heard of them. Uh, same sort of thing. But again, you know, more and more companies were, were heading down this path. So we thought, instead of trying to fight them, their desire to buy direct, we were going to try to help them. So we ended up building um, a, something that we called a stock replenishment order processing system. So now we've morphed from distribution to the stock replenishment order processing. So what we do is we go into the retailers and to the buyers, the central buyers, and they tell us you know, how much of what products they want in which stores. And we would go in with these data collection devices and count inventory, transmit that back to our system. It would compare it to the design, you know, what they had on hand, to desired levels, what was already on order from the factory, what the case packs were, the minimum orders, and that sort of thing. And then we generate these orders and send them off to the factory, and they drop them <coughs> into the stores. Now, the beauty of that was we could walk in with these reports to buyers to show them all their inventory and all their stores and their sell-through and information that they had just never seen before. They were like, "This is this is wonderful." So uh, they started to coerce all of their manufacturers to pay us a commission, a percentage of the rev of the sales that we orders that we generated, to perform this service. So, um, uh, and, and basically by by uh, 
1987, we had 75 people around the 17 Western United States going in and counting stock and you know all these different retailers. Um, I think if you took like a hardware store like Ernst Hardware Stores, you, uh, they're not around either, but uh, we probably handled a quarter of the items, so maybe 10,000 items we were counting once or twice a week in their stores and transmitting this data. And it was kind of fun too because we also got involved in the early stages of EDI, Electronic Data Interchange. In those times, at the beginning of that, there were all kind of proprietary systems of OrderNet and EagleNet and different, you know, uh, Sears had a different system than you know other retailers, but there was a standard ANSI X12 that was emerging at the time, and so we got involved in that and started um, doing electronic order and and advanced, what's called advanced shipping notices. We get those back and tied that into our system, so it all became pretty cool, and pretty automated. But that was a lot of fun to set up, but I really didn't like the business very much. Fortunately, my partner really did was really good at coordinating what 75 people did and their schedules and coordinating with our customers and all of that. For me, it was like, eh, okay, the fun's over, we made it work, now let's do something else. So in 87, we ended up selling that to a manufacturer's rep company that um, strategically thought this would help them get uh, better product lines or better relationships with the different brands and different vendors. And uh, so we sold that to them, and my partner went with them. And uh, this was the first point in time when I actually was in the software business solely um, in 1987, and the, the company became um, Point Information Network, or PIN. Uh, so uh, I think I drank too much coffee. I'm kind of going <laughs> But um, I'm, I'm going to jump faster as we get going. But so, uh, so now I'm in the software business, and now I'm building, uh, I'm selling in warehouse systems to different companies, doing, um, I built like a truck scaling system, and a curbside recycling, a route accounting system, and an export brokerage system, and lots of different <coughs> systems for different companies. Um, and, uh, um, and when you start to build, a, a, you know, like a lot of people in the software business, you know, you're, when you're making, when you're doing this sell one, make one sort of scenario of custom software development, um, there's all this lure of getting to the make one, sell many model. So that's what we wanted. We wanted to be a products company instead of a custom software company. So we, we had been building tools to use to develop our systems. And at, in, in, uh, um, in 1989, we moved to um, selling that product, we named it Point of View, and we started going to trade shows and selling that product, and that became our primary business. So we kind of migrated out of building custom systems for companies, and now we were selling tools to build your own systems. Uh, there's another thing that happened in 1989 was we got involved, because of our kind of expertise with a certain set of mainframes and uh, the, you know, our mobile devices and the comms between, we were asked by Linden Transportation to do a project uh, they had a big problem. They sent barges up to Alaska, and they stopped at a bunch of different ports. If you put a container and get it on the wrong, in the wrong area of the barge, it's a real problem because you have to unload it evenly so it still floats, doesn't tip over. Um, so they had a problem with that. We set this up. It was a really difficult uh, project. We had to write, you know, burn EEPROMs, write code and assembly for the mobile device. We had to write all the comms. We had to write the interfaces into their servers. But it worked and everyone was happy and we didn't really think too much of it until the next year when the FCC um, opened the 902 to 928 megahertz range so it was no longer licensed. The original project with uh, Linden was using narrowband technology which is really a pain in the rear end to deploy. Um, so you probably might remember this because some of you, anyway, you might remember this as the point at which uh, people came out with um, cordless phones. Not mobile phones, cordless phones, you know. That was using this 902 to 928 megahertz. Well, a couple of big players, including Symbol Technology, started to build specialized devices and proprietary networks in this 902 to 928 megahertz range. So we got the bright idea that we were going to build this thin client model for these mobile devices tie it into our screen developing tool that we had built for the server side 
and come up with something that abstracted people from the whole the complexities of the wireless network and go after the distribution industry. And we did, and we kind of built that out into some very specific um, uh, APIs for different development environments and different languages in addition to being just a screen generator. Um, and so we launched something that, by 1992, we launched uh, our Wavelink Studio product and the company morphed to being called Wavelink and that was the core business, that became the core business. So as you can see, we've done a lot of, we did a lot of pivoting. <laughs> There's a lot of switching uh, on and off here. But this turned out to be a good thing. We did um, really, really well with this. And um, uh, we were selling basically this product all around the world. So some of the companies that we um, automated, uh, you know, pretty much in all industries of material handling, everybody from, you know, from Walmart to FedEx to UPS to you name it, basically. Here's some of the names, there's some more names, but lots of different companies that we automated during that period of time. Some of them we were completely, you know, tied into the actual integration, and that was a lot of fun to do. Others we did through partners. We had partners around the world. And so that was kind of the main thrust of that business. In the early 90s, we got to participate in that whole migration to paperless warehouses. So like I walked into the Spiegel Eddie Bauer distribution facility in Columbus, Ohio. It was a three and a half million square foot distribution facility. And they had a room that was 100,000 square feet that was full of Printronics printers and key punch operators. And we left a week later and that room was empty and everyone was using those wearable devices that you saw on the previous screen with the ring scanner. And uh, um, and we were tied into their conveyor sorter and router. It was it was a lot of fun to do. So we did a lot of projects like that. Um, we also ended up getting involved in managing the mobile devices themselves. So you know, Target would have eighty thousand mobile devices. If they needed to update anything to those devices, there was a general. We built consoles for being able to go in and deploy those out and make sure they get there. With, even if the devices in somebody's desk are often you know, off at repair. When it comes back, it's configured right, loaded right, updated right. And we also did the, um, the systems for managing their wireless networks themselves. Um, and so we were also <coughs> part of that kind of transition in the late 90s from proprietary wireless networks to um, industry standards. So like I was an early voting member of IEEE 802.11 that uh, uh, came up with the uh, Wi-Fi standard. And actually, I was in the group that named Wi-Fi um, and became the Wi-Fi Alliance, but uh, I have to admit I didn't really like the name. But it turned out pretty well. Uh, no. um, so anyway, so that's really uh, what Wavelink did. I could probably talk for hours on that subject. Question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what did you do for the United Nations? You know, um, they actually, it's amazing what they distribute. They have uh, distribution facilities for moving products oh, around the yeah. world. Oh, yeah, like food aid and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's all kinds okay. of, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, it's a yeah. strange collection. Of, it's amazing who handles I know, just really diverse stuff. Yeah. yeah, so basically anybody who handles merchandise. We had, I think, eight of the top ten retailers in the U.S. and nine of the top ten in Europe and uh, most of the freight companies and whatever, so, you know. So you've grown a lot of businesses really quickly. How do you know when it's time to hire, when it's too much for you and your partner? Oh, man. Well, I'll show you later on the slide. But, um, uh, you know, that's it. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I, our company, my companies were always bootstrapped. So, you know, the checkbook decided a lot of things. Um, uh, uh, you know, it, it actually wasn't that difficult to decide. But we we were always always profitable, so um, uh, it was really just a matter of whether you know whether we could justify it, whether whether we were targeting some new market or or whatever. Um, uh, I have a more current issue with that right now because I'm in a startup right now that I could use a lot more people than I have. I'm desperate to to get more people involved in. Um, but waiting because I'm trying to generate some real revenue. Uh, so anyway, um, I was going to bring up something that happened. I, I, 
uh, to kind of illustrate some other aspects in business, but in, um, in 1997, uh, so kind of a tragic event happened for me, which was that uh, my father, who was in the software business also, a company called Seattle Lab, he was a, the, the uh, a majority shareholder of that company, um, and they did things like, um, they turned, you know, Windows NT into multi-user instead of just multitasking. So they wrote Telnet servers and uh, serial uh, comms servers, and they built kind of the first uh, POP3 mail server that ran on, on Windows and Windows NT. And so they were selling that all over the world. And then uh, on one uh, horrible day in uh, March of 1997, uh, we got word that my father went into the hospital and... Uh, um, by the time we got more information, it was sounding more and more dire. It, uh, uh, we started hearing things like, well, he has cancer. Well, yes, it's metastasized. And by the late, by the end of that day, that we, we were hearing that he may never get out of the, out of the hospital. And that's kind of a, you know, that's a traumatic thing in any family. I'm the only one in my, of my siblings that's been in business or in the software business. So, um, you know, you're sitting there, I, I don't know medicine, I wish I did, but I didn't. Um, so the only thing I could do was try to think of, you know, what, you know, what could I do? Um, and so, uh, thinking of the prospect of my mother now being a, a majority shareholder of a software company, I decided to go just take a look at his, um, at the company. And I started looking at the, uh, the articles of incorporation, the bylaws, and the buy-sell agreement. And I was just shocked when I read this because, you know, I always thought my father was a good business person. But their buy-sell agreement basically said if you left the company, quit, fired, died, that your the other um, investor, the other owners could buy your share at book value. Well, this company had no book value. I mean, the book value was really low. Like they didn't uh, they didn't capitalize their software development. They didn't, you know, they didn't, it was a subchapter S corporation, so there was no money in it. There really wasn't any book value. So, so I just was kind of panicked at the prospect that that uh, now my mother was going to end up with not very much money as a result of this. So um, I was trying to think about what to do, and I went and talked to their corporate attorney because I had come up with a plan and I wanted to see if it would work. And they agreed, so I had him draft a, a letter. And the next chance that I got to speak to my father was that Friday evening. And I said, hey, I want you to make me president of your company because I need to go fix some things. And uh, um, he said, okay, and signed it, and I became uh, president of the company. And so Saturday morning, I called his two partners, and I said, they asked, obviously, how he was, and I told them it was dire. And, I said, but I'm calling because I need to fire you. And, uh, you know, I'm now president and I need to fire you. Don't freak out, but let's get together Monday morning and I think we can fix this. So as it turned out, <laughs> well, you know, you know uh, fortunately it was over the phone. Nobody would hit me or anything. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, they were trying to be understanding and they weren't really sure what was going on. but. Uh, but as it turned out, my father did die that Sunday, and uh, Monday I went in and met with his partners, and I said, hey, you know, I fired you because I wanted to trigger the buy-sell agreement in favor of my mother before it got triggered in reverse. But here's what I propose. I propose we tear this up and start over, and they said, okay, that sounds like a good idea. So we did that, and then so my nighttime job for three years was being the, the chairman and CEO of Seattle Lab. I drug my younger brother into the business too. Um, and then uh, in, in 2000, we ended up selling it to a French company called BBRP for way more money than it was worth. So it was you know, at that time where things were crazy. Um, you know, it was a good company, but it wasn't worth the kind of money that we sold it for. As a matter of fact, the interesting thing was the company was valued based on the number of developers. Not revenue, not anything. Just total number of developers. And I think that was partly because the French companies, other companies around the world were very envious of NASDAQ and the kind of multiples in valuation that companies were getting in the U.S. on NASDAQ. So I think as part of their overall story, they were trying to get a foothold into the United States and maybe trying to pitch people that someday they'd end up on NASDAQ and get those kind of multiples. So they overpaid and we were happy and everything worked out, at least for us. Uh, but the moral of that story was, was really that 
um, you know, these, these, it's hard to imagine you know, people who make kind of really critical sort of mistakes, like that buy sell agreement. Um, you know, you, you have to, the time to make those kinds of decisions and deal with it is at the beginning. So I was just um, really surprised to see that, that happen. I think it's kind of a good example of what, what not to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I've made lots of mistakes too, so uh, I can go into that with but I, As a matter of fact, one of my old partners, when I said I was doing the presentation, he said, well, you can just go talk about all the things you did wrong. And I said, well, I don't have that much time. So. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of things. Um, but anyway, so that was Seattle Lab. Um, and then, um, let's see, what do I have in here? Oh, no. It's, oh, that's out of order. Oh, that's really sad. Okay. I'm sorry about that. I, can't, I meant to uh, kind of adjust the order of some things. But um, I'm going to skip over that for the moment. No, oh, no. My order's messed up. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Don't look at that. <laughs> so that's me in 2003. This was uh, me after a heart attack and a five-way bypass. So that's another thing you don't want to do. Um, Let's see if I can get back to these uh, other slides. Um, so, and after after selling Seattle Lab, I thought, okay, well, you know, uh, I knew a little bit more about uh, money, raising money, and the capital markets, and that process. And it seemed like a good idea to go out and raise money uh, to expand my business. So I went out and raised, you know, nine million dollars, and then I bought my largest competitor. And, uh, you know, life was good. Um, and then uh, so that was our big events for 2000. And uh, I thought, oh, that was fun. Let's do that some more. So I raised more money. Um, and 2002, that was an interesting time, too. I was going to mention the fact that I ended up taking, it was, I had some time and uh, was able to go um, spend some time writing patents. And that's an interesting experience in and of itself. I wrote a bunch of patents about, um, like uh, wireless LAN technology, like rogue access point detection and key rotation for security and uh, uh, power and channel management in large um, wireless LAN environments and that sort of thing. And that's a really long, slow process. As a matter of fact, one of the things I wrote in 2002, we just got the patent for it in 2011. So it's kind of a long process. But, um, and that's kind of something that uh, if we had time, we could talk about that whole process uh, as, a, as a talking point all in and of itself. Um, but again, you know, life was good until about here. In 2003, I, uh, I keeled over dead, basically. The only reason I survived is my wife knew CPR and kept me going. And, uh, you know, I was playing catch with my son in the yard, and I just keeled over. Um, so, I, you know, I, I've never been, uh, I mean, I've always been thin. I didn't really look like a heart attack, but apparently that doesn't really count. Um, so, uh, that, at that point, I decided, okay, well, this is a good time to try to, um, well, actually, my doctors were basically telling me that, you know, they're pretty dire when they give you, maybe you, you can help me with this, but... They're pretty dire in their predictions. It's like, well, you've got a 50, 50 chance of living five years. It's like, okay, well, that's, that's really helpful. Um, so, uh, so I decided that, um, that I really didn't want my wife to end up being partners with my um, investors. And so over the next couple of years, I worked towards selling my interest in the company to my investors. And anybody who deals with VCs can tell you that, you know, the founders are not the first people out. As a matter of fact, they're the last people out. And uh, it's like the cardinal rule. You don't, you know, investors don't get out until, until especially after, until the lead investor's out. Um, and, uh, but I had made a particular, at the first time when I raised money, I put a clause in the agreement in the A round um, that turned out to be really pivotal for me. At that point, I still own 75%. So after second round, I was in. I was not majority holder, um, and uh, um, and so when I got to this point, it was really uh, when I got to the point that I wanted to sell it. This particular clause turned out to be that, that I had 
you know, that they thought was not particularly onerous at the point where I owned most of the company anyway. So they had agreed to it. And it really gave me first, it gave me uh, approval rights on any sale of the company to anybody. So I could just say yes or no. And, uh, and that turned out to be um, uh, helpful in convincing them that maybe I could go before they go. Um, and that's what I ended up doing. I ended up selling the company, or my interest in the company. And it's gone on and done uh, very, very well. Um, it just sold last year, I think, for uh, like $85 million or something like that. So it did pretty well. More than I got, that's for sure. Um, anyway, so now I'm, um, I wonder if I can get back in the track here and get back into the, uh, into the presentation mode. I'm not sure how I'm supposed to do that. Okay, well, I'm going manually then. Here we go. Let's see if I can do this. So that's really kind of, uh, at, at that point, I, it, it was the beginning of 2005. I went back to school. I learned French and Spanish and took up fly fishing and did lots of other things to de stress my life. And, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, but um, I always liked technology, so I was kind of involved in a bunch of different pieces of technology, and I kept, you know, my hands on all the, the latest uh, toys and gadgets. And we had been raising money, back when we were raising money in 2001, there was all this talk about the mobile devices, mobile phones, really, and all the capabilities and what was going to happen with that and the growth. And it was, you know, typical uh, overhype of capabilities. I mean, the phones were doing like WAP at the time. It wasn't like the phones that we have today. It was, you know that market really wasn't going to happen that quickly. As a matter of fact, until you know Steve Jobs decided to make an iPhone, I don't think that market really took off at all. But here I was now thinking, okay, well, uh, now these phones do all of those things that we were talking about <coughs> 10 years ago, and maybe this would be fun to get back involved in. And so uh, we had built you know, a bunch of you know, uh, mobile apps for people just to get our feet wet, building iPhone and iPad and Android apps and, uh, and that sort of thing while we were trying to figure out a startup to build. And I convinced my daughter who had just graduated from UCLA to come back to Seattle out of the sun and, and get involved in, in a company. And we decided, we were looking at different technologies to pick and we decided to target um, um, NFC. Um, and how many people are familiar with your field communication or NFC? Yeah, okay. So pretty, pretty broad group. So, you know, NFC is basically a form of uh, RFID, so radio frequency identification. So they, they're just little, for those of you who aren't, haven't seen them, little um, tags like this. They have an antenna and a small IC, and they're literally powered by the magnetic field of the reader. So you hold a reader up to the, up to the phone, and it generates enough power in that magnetic field to power up the tag and make it do something. So, um, uh, so I have a bunch of tags here if anybody wants to play with them at some point. And there, it's, it's intended to be, it's not like traditional radio frequency technology that was uh, large distance. This is intended to be very close, so it's one to four centimeter um, uh, contact. So it's, it really kind of mirrors the physical world's equivalent of clicking on something. You, it shows intent. You're tapping on something because you want to pay for something or you want more information about something. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we thought, okay, this, this technology might take off. So we decided we'd go out and build a um, platform for managing large numbers of these tags as they go out into the real world. And uh, we started a company that's called uh, TapWise. Um, so, you know, you start to see things like this now where you can walk <coughs> up and, you know, hold your phone up to, to a sign like this. and like download a song in this particular case of the Samsung ad. Um, uh, the, I, the biggest thing holding back uh, NFC last year was simply the fact that the iPhone hasn't supported it. But um, Samsung's did a pretty good job of beating them up for not having done it. So how many of you have seen like the commercial that they, the commercials that Samsung have done? Um, how many of you have seen like the, the, the Jay Leno version of that? Um, it's kind of funny, I actually brought it, I was going to show it to you. So, um, so <laughs> if you've seen the one where the guy... Is that a Samsung Galaxy commercial where the wife gives the husband a video for the airport? Yeah. Uh, that's that new phone, you just touch it and it automatically transfers the video. 
So some, there are different companies that, that uh, you know, all the Android devices, now we've got um, the Windows Phone 8, we've got uh, the, the, um, you know, the Nokias of the world have been in NFC for a long time, and even now, like the, the well, the Blackberries have been in, and the Blackberry <coughs> device also supports it. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Thank you. Technical help. Thank you, Richard. Um, so I, you know, what kind of things I do is I go out and... Uh, teach people how to, you know, this is like an Android class, I teach developers on how to integrate like tags into applications and we, in our platform we have an API that's designed for integrating into our platform but, but just basically how do you, uh, how do you read tags and code tags, get that sort of data. We do, I teach classes on that from time to time and, uh, um, and again, so kind of to sort of explain what we do with, with TapWise, we have, um, just a little explainer video that's probably uh, easier to, it's better to show it than for me to try to try to explain it. So I don't know where that is. Uh, I minimized but, it. What's that? Minimized? I minim yeah, it should be minimized. Okay. It's the quick time at the bottom. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, you know, I kind of too much into my math, sorry guys. Um, All the way in the tray. Is it yep. Okay, yep. Um, I don't know if there's a full screen mode on this. That's good. Okay, that's good enough. Okay. Um, Hi, we're TapWise, and we're here to enhance the way your business interacts with its customers through merchandising and marketing. Meet Joe. Like most people, Joe has a smartphone. Joe's pretty cool, so he has a new phone. And like most new phones, Joe's phone has new NFC touch technology which means he can engage with the world by tapping on NFC touch points. Joe can tap on a movie poster to watch his trailer. His kids can tap their toys to unlock hidden video game levels. And Joe's wife can tap posters around the mall to download coupons straight into her mobile wallet. As cool as NFC is for consumers like Joe and his family, it's even better for businesses like yours. Every time a potential customer taps his phone on one of your touch points, it generates consumer data equivalent to that of an online click, which means that you can measure your performance in the real world, just like you track it online, capturing the who, what, when, where, and how of every tap with your physical media. At TapWise, we make this possible with our cloud-based management platform. We enable you to track physical world, consumer engagement, and even update your touch points, content, and function in real time. It's really pretty simple. Here's how it works. Just create an account and order some touch point end tags from our online store. Have us program them for you in advance, or do it yourself. As soon as your end tags ship, you have full access to our suite of management and analytics tools. Keep customers coming back for more with dynamic touch points. The same physical poster, for example, can provide a 10% off coupon one day and an exclusive secret sale pass the next. Reprogramming your touch points is easy, and you can even schedule automatic updates based on date, time, or number of taps. That's all there is to it. Just sit back, 
relax, and watch your target audience engage with your physical media. View data analytics through our platform or download engagement reports and integrate them into your own performance system. What are you waiting for? If your customers are anything like Joe and his family, they're eager to engage with your business in new ways. Create a free account today and start tracking performance like never before. Okay, so that's um, that's our SaaS software as a service model where people can come in and create accounts. And we have like uh, mobile device clients for encoding tags that associate in with that. And as I said, APIs are kind of going up and down the supply chain. But uh, we also, um, the other core part of our business is white labeling that to companies that are looking to be able to provide their own management. So we work with companies that do, you know, there's a lot of companies in a, there's a lot of different industries where this technology can be applied. But one example is uh, sign companies that want to become interactive sign companies. And, uh, but they don't necessarily have the, the skill sets there, but they can white label something in that ties into their business. They can offer this kind of service to their customers. And, and that's really our overall um, business model, um, uh, I guess, in a nutshell. So I could probably go on and talk about that for a long time. I don't know if there's any specific questions about that. But that's really what we're doing now. So we're back into a full startup mode. This is bootstrapped. We do, you know, we build apps and things for other companies. I, you know, we just build apps to do everything from, you know, there's a company that's doing tagging people and tapping them when they go to jump off of ski jumps to see if they've signed the waiver and done whatever, how many taps they have. Uh, but one of the big trends is really that companies are looking to migrate away from, in the mobile world, uh, looking to migrate away from web-based user interfaces and get to more native app interfaces. And uh, we provide a really good mechanism for being able to support that kind of a migration model. So for example, one of the big differences between things like NFC tags and things like QR codes is you can encode a lot of different data in them. They're not just, you know, it's not, it's, uh, and, and different, you have different ways of being able to leverage the different kinds of data records that are stored in the, in the tags themselves. So um, we can take a tag that, um, that if you tapped it with your phone and you don't have Target's loyalty program, it's going to take you to based on what kind of device you have, it's going to take you to where you can load the app. Um, if you already have the app, though, or once you've loaded it and you tap it again, it launches the app and takes you directly into the, you know, starts interacting with the application itself. So a single tag can kind of provide that dual sort of functionality. And it gives you a migration path so that if you have something that's web-based now and you come out with, you know, an Android or a WPA or whatever kind of client, those clients that you don't have a uh, you know, those devices that you don't have a client for still go to, you know, the, the web page or whatever, and you can kind of migrate into this. And we think that there's, um, that basically every company out there is really looking to get to, get their loyalty program, whether you're Alaska Airlines or whether you're Target or whether you're Starbucks or whoever you are, to get your code and to get your customer information and get you into their loyalty program and preferably get your credit card numbers. Um, and you know, retailers in particular really understand the fact that when you stand in front of merchandise in their stores, you have a lot less information available to you than you do when you're at home in front of your computer. And so, you know, that inspires people with these mobile phones to go look up, you know, data in other places. And NFC offers a very frictionless way for them to be able to uh, influence your buying. They can provide that information to you. I mean, Costco can give you the customer reviews and comparisons. They'd rather give it to you than have you go get it somewhere else. Um, and so if you take that and combine that with the idea of being able to give the loyalty program, potentially get you at a best time to be able to buy the item right there at the shelf instead of walking away knowing that you probably won't come back. There's a lot of incentive for people to do that. And a big challenge is how do you get these apps onto people's devices in, again, this kind of frictionless sort of way. And when you compare, you know, uh, NFC to to something like QR codes, um, again, QR codes. I think that one of the biggest problems with QR codes was that the operating systems didn't inherently support them. So you have to, you know, you know, you have to go find an app. You have to load, you know, bring the app up you, if you have it, and then you have to like take a picture of it. So even if you're technically, you know, geekish, it's still going to take you 10 seconds to do that. And if you compare that to me. You know, taking my phone and and uh, um, and tapping a tag, 
it's just there's just really no comparison in terms of that frictionless capability. So uh, I don't know. Now I'm just rambling at this point. So um, you know that's kind of a, a, a short story of Bob, I guess, in terms of you know how I started in one path and kind of headed down a bunch of different paths and pivoting and um, uh, and here's where I ended up. Anyway, so that's kind of that. Okay. Yeah. Our, I don't know if we're transferring the yep. question time. Yeah. Let's yeah. Just